This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. Uh, this is the second lecture on Chapter 18 of the Paper P4 course notes. And in the first lecture, uh, we weren't actually looking at exchange risk. We were looking at just how to use the exchange rates that are given in the exam. Uh, but now let's uh, talk about um, what we mean by foreign exchange risk. Uh, and in fact, any trading abroad, there are really three types of risk that we encounter. Uh, and they're listed on page 97 of the course notes. Uh, paragraph 2 says types of risk, um, transaction risk, translation risk, and economic risk. Now, just very quickly, if I start from the bottom, um, economic risk, oh dear, I'm sorry, economic risk Uh, it says there, it's changing present value of future cash flows due to unexpected movements in foreign exchange rates. Um, there's a bit more to it than that, and uh, there's no numbers involved here for the exam. But it's just the fact that if you're dealing abroad, surely you're at risk due to changes in the economy abroad. Um, if exchange rates move, it may make your goods more attractive, less attractive. You may sell more, you may sell less. Uh, but also, more general economic factors... Um, the rate of inflation in the other country, the uh, tax rate in the other country, and so on. Now, that one, be aware of, but we're not interested in terms of the numbers of paper P4. Uh, the second one, translation risk. What we're talking about here, I think you, you'll all have done paper P2, and you probably know better than me, um, that if you're preparing... Um, consolidated accounts and you have a subsidiary or your assets in a foreign country then at the date of the balance sheet they'll need to converting into your home currency if you're a UK company with assets in America um, you'll need to convert them into pounds at balance sheet date and of course from year to year the value of the assets can change simply because of movements in the exchange rate well, we call that translation risk. But again, as financial manager, we're not terribly bothered about that because it's a paper gain or a paper loss. The financial manager is much more worried about real money, you know, when we actually come to get the dollars or pay the dollars. And so the one that we're concerned with is the remaining one, transaction risk. And all we mean by it, perhaps the most obvious of all, but to save me talking for half an hour, suppose I tell you today is the 1st of May. We're in the UK. Uh, we need to pay uh, perhaps an American supplier $100,000. But we need to pay it in six weeks' time. Now, our problem is that since we're in the UK, we're going to have to convert, we're going to have to pay for those dollars in pounds. And whatever the current exchange rate is, you know, I'm not going to do numbers here, but just suppose the current exchange rate, uh, dollar to the pound, was 0.5. So one pound equals, oh, let's put it the other way, sorry, more realistically, exchange rate of two. So there are two dollars to the pound. If we're paying today, no problem. It would be £50,000. But the trouble is, of course, in six weeks' time, the exchange rate could have moved. In theory, it could have moved to anything. And depending on whether the exchange rate's gone up or down, uh, the cost to us in pounds may be higher or lower. But if we do nothing at all, we're at risk. You know, the whole nature of risk is we're not certain of the amount. Uh, I think clearly, depending on which way the exchange rate moves in six weeks' time, we might gain, we might lose. But we're not thinking of it here in terms of gains and losses particularly. It's the fact that we're not certain, which gives rise to risk. And the problem is, 
how can we go about reducing or removing that risk uh, of exchange rate movement? Now, that's transaction risk. That's um, what the numbers involve. Uh, and that's what we have to go through. Well, if you turn to page 99 of the notes, you've got there a list of methods of hedging transaction exposure. Um, there's how many? Four, uh, six, eight, uh, nine things to be aware of. The first four of them really are nothing more than um, a few lines of discussion. I'll explain, but I think they're all, all four are fairly obvious. The real numbers uh, are in the bottom five. So let's first of all chat quickly through the first four. How might we go about avoiding that exchange risk I just mentioned? The problem that we need $100,000, but uh, we're not going to need to buy the dollars for six weeks. Well, the most obvious way of all is dealing in your home currency, invoices in the home currency. This surely is very obvious that if I'm in the UK, fine, I might deal with uh, an American company, but if I can invoice them in pounds and they pay me in pounds, then I'm not at risk. They've got the risk of exchange rate movements. And similarly, if I buy from America, if I can persuade them to invoice me in pounds, then again, there's no risk. So that's the easiest one of all, if you can achieve it. Uh, clearly, a supplier in America is perhaps unlikely to be prepared to invoice you in pounds. And even a customer in America if it's a big customer and they insist on being invoiced in dollars, you might well agree to it rather than um, potentially lose the sale. However, that would be the most obvious one of all. Uh, and in the exam, whatever numbers may be asked, be prepared, uh, as a written part of the question, be prepared to suggest other things you might consider, of which that, I hope, is the most obvious. Uh, the next one, leading and lagging. I don't actually like being in this list. Uh, you'll see why as I explain. But what it is, is suppose again I'm in the UK and I owe dollars to a supplier. Well, I think common sense would tell us that if we felt... Um, that the dollar was going to move against us, then the sooner we pay the supplier, the better. Whereas, if we felt the dollar was going to move in our favour, then it would make sense to delay payment as long as possible. And that's what leading and lagging means. Leading is where you pay early. Uh, lagging is where you pay late or delay paying, depending on the way you expect the exchange rate to move. Now, I said a moment ago, I don't really like it being on this list, because although it is fairly common sense, I think it's something most companies would consider if they're dealing uh, abroad. Uh, clearly, it doesn't remove risk. There is still risk. However certain I may be that the dollar is going to move against me, and therefore I pay early. Of course, I could be wrong, and the dollar might move in my favour, and vice versa. So there is still risk. Uh, subject to that, I think it's uh, fairly common sense. Uh, the next one, netting. Well, again, when I explain, hopefully this is a very obvious one indeed, and certainly 
it has often been relevant in the exam as a very small, uh, what you might call, start to the question. But suppose I gave you a, a list of transactions that were going to take place. Suppose I told you, um, in three months' time, uh, we expect we'll need to pay a supplier $100,000. Uh, we're in the UK again, remember. But suppose I also told you that in three months' time, we expect to receive from a customer Ooh, $80,000. Well, surely we'd be completely stupid to um, handle each transaction separately. Would it not make sense just to use the receipt to make the payment, to convert it into um, pounds? It would be mad. Use the receipt to make the payment. And we've uh, all we've got then is a net payment of 20,000. And unless we do something else, it's just 20,000 that's at risk. And we'll look later at other things we might do to remove or reduce that risk. Uh, but on several occasions in the exam, there's been a great long list of transactions. These happen in three months' time. We've got some others that happen in one month time. Well, when you've got several transactions in the same currency on the same date, simply net them off, and the rest of the question uh, would be looking at how we could deal with the risk that's remaining on that 20,000. Finally, of these first four, matching, which it does have a similarity, but make sure, as I try and explain, make sure you see the difference, uh, why it's not the same as netting. What it is here, suppose again, I'm in the UK, and suppose I had to tell you I receive regular income um, from America uh, of approximately ooh, $100,000 per year. Now, that's just part of my income. Perhaps most of my income comes from the UK and is in pounds and is no problem. But I'm getting 100000 a year from America. Uh, and, of course, as exchange rates change in the future, that's a risk. Depending on the way the exchange rates move, uh, my income some years might be higher. My pound income some years might be lower. Well, one rather neat way of effectively removing that risk would be to deliberately create an expense in dollars. Now, for instance, I'll give you two examples. Uh, I've already said that maybe most of my sales are in the UK. Maybe I sell a million a year in the UK and $100,000 to America. Uh, maybe my supplies, normally I buy all my supplies in the UK, which is where I'm based. But what I might deliberately decide to do is, for example, buy some materials from the US, uh, at about $100,000, the amount of the income. Because if I could achieve that, just think of the consequence, that year by year, if the, if the dollar strengthens, I'll put it the other way, sorry, first, if the dollar weakens, my income in sterling, in pounds, uh, is lower, but at the same time, if I have an expense in dollars and the dollar's weakened, the, the pound equivalent goes down as well. The two, the two go down together. But equally, if the dollar went up in value, my income goes up, but so too does the expense. I'm sure you can imagine, year by year, as exchange rates changed, 
the income and expense both go up and down together, um, the net effect is zero. Now, it may, may not be possible to hedge the amount exactly, but the nearer you can be to having an equivalent uh, income and expense in the same currency, the nearer you are to matching them, um, the less you're exposed to risk. Or you see another way you could um, create an expense. Maybe I need to borrow money. The company's going to borrow money, whatever happens, and normally we would borrow in pounds. What I might do is borrow in dollars. And so if we have dollar borrowing, then, of course, we've got an interest expense in dollars. And again, the nearer the expense was uh, to 100,000, in this case to the amount of the income, uh, the nearer they matched in terms of the amount, the less I'd be exposed to risk. They go up and down together, the net effect would be zero. Okay, well, they were just four to be able to discuss. Uh, and on plenty of occasions, you've had a chance in the um, written part of the question to mention some or all of those. However, the real learning, the real studying, the real practicing is on the next ones, forward markets, uh, forward contracts rather, etc. So again, I'll stop this lecture here. The third lecture will start looking at the, uh, the technical ones where the numbers are involved.